I'm not Fluffy Pony. Sorry. Come on in, everybody. Grab a seat. My name is Mike Savvy. They flew me all the way in from Philly, and boy, is my block folio tired. All right. Actually, uh, you know what? Before we get started, while you guys are getting a seat, I just got to uh, do one thing. Um, you guys are actually in for a treat. I heard Fluffy Pony's going to make some uh, really exciting announcements about Monero, so hold on. All right. Bye. 20 Monero. All right, cool. All right, my bio order's good. All right, so. All right, now my, uh, I don't really have much to sell except for some jokes. I hope you guys laugh. That's pretty much it. I don't have any uh, shit coins to show. I'm my own shit coin. I'm showing myself. Now my, um, we took an Uber on the way over here. I just wanted to, uh, I don't just wanted to point this out. It's kind of messed with my head a little bit. So we're on the way here, and I uh, came to a stop sign, and we stopped. But on the stop sign, it was like, it's not like vandalized, but somebody put something on the stop sign to make the stop sign look like a mess. Like, uh, they made it so that the stop sign said, stop rape. Great idea. That just means somebody's walking around in Las Vegas right now with a bunch of stickers that just say rape on them. Like, <laughs> I, like I don't, I, could you imagine getting caught with... <laughs> Like, uh, could you, are you driving down the street, cop pulls you over, officer, uh, huh, what, what'd you put, oh, license or registration, hang on, it's right here in the club box, you go to open the a whole bunch of, like, I don't know, the gun fell out, and, like, shot the cop, then I have a bunch of, like, hunt, like, rape stickers fall out, so now that we got the rape jokes out of the way and the cop shooting jokes out of the way, let's get into some <laughs> crypto stuff, I'm a realtor by trade, so I sell houses, uh, to whoever still wants to buy them, I, uh, <laughs> We don't sell them for Bitcoin just yet, but uh, honestly, I'm looking for a different career, okay? I've been doing it for about 15 years, and one of the biggest reasons I want, I'm just like, I like people, I just hate when people ask you stupid questions. Should they think that I should know? Like, I'm a real estate agent, I can tell you about value, but when somebody says, is there a lot of sex offenders in the neighborhood? I just go, yeah. <laughs> They're everywhere. Like, they'll come knock on your front door. Has that ever happened to anybody here? I had a, I had a guy that came and knocked on my front door, and he said, Hi, my, like I looked outside first. He didn't have a clipboard, didn't have a badge. I'm like, okay, here, this guy might be okay. I go, I open the door, tells me he's Steve the sex offender. I said, okay, bye, Steve the sex offender. That was all our entire encounter. But I looked him up online. You know, you can do this. I cyber stalk everybody. I'll probably cyber stalk half of you. Uh, there's, he lives in a house, but right next door to him lives another sex offender. Like, it, 19027, look this up on your phones if you don't believe me, right? Uh, actually, by the way, does anybody have, you guys scared the shit out of me about coming to DEF CON. I don't have my, like, f smart, I bought one of these. <laughs> I'm scared to death. Oh, shit, I did the Monero, fuck, I ruined that one. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, marijuana's legal in Las Vegas. I just found out two days ago. It does affect the memory. Um... So anyway, these guys, I just kind of imagine, like, what was it like when these two sex offenders met? Because when I bought my house and I drove my motorcycle up the driveway for the first time, my neighbor darted over because he has three motorcycles. And we're, like, the best of friends now. And I don't want to say that they're, like, these guys share, like, anything disgusting. Like, not anything gross. I just got to imagine, like, hey, uh, I got a bunch of kids coming over next door. I'm out of crayons. Do you think that you could? I like when they color. Uh, another reason I kind of got into crypto, honestly, aside from just the money, because uh, one thing I believe about crypto is that I do believe that Bitcoin is going to just eventually destroy the dollar. Because I personally destroyed thousands of dollars in <laughs> cryptocurrency. And if I can do it, I know that together we can all do it. But I did. I, was, uh, I got into crypto because I was kind of depressed. And the community is really what brought me back out of my like funk, right? And uh, for anybody that's felt that way, I know what it feels like to be depressed and introverted, not want to leave your house. And it's hard. Uh, it's, it's even a little nerve wracking just to kind of talk about some of the things that I felt like I went through. But I want to share one of the things that really helped me in my depression. So, uh, you know, just personally, like, you can look this up online. It's like, I watched a lot of self-help videos called Jerk Off Encouragement. <laughs> like, these girls look right at you and they're just like, stroke that cock. And I'm like, I am. Like, I don't want another reason to be sad, you know? So I got into crypto, it was a little bit better. It's true. Oh, uh, okay, I did want to share this one last thing with you. I, I sold some Bitcoin last night uh, to make some bad decisions. 
Um, and I've been apologizing to Bitcoin all fucking morning. Like, she's my wife. I'm like, honey, I'm sorry. I swear, if you go back up, I will never, ever sell you again. She still hasn't talked to me. So I've been texting gold for like all morning too. Just like it's a backup. You got to have a backup, you know? Listen, you fall in love, those sort of things happen. Um, all right, we'll, we'll bring up our... Uh, Friend of mine. I just want to tell you, what, why the, what, what am I doing in, in Las Vegas? I was brought here for a show that was called the Crypto Shit Show. It was just evolved into something called the Crypto Integrity Show. And we got a lot of real... Which, whatever, you can make of that what you need to. But I'm here with a, a really good friend of mine named Ken Bozak, uh, Nathan Hawk from the IoT Village, who put this all together. And uh, Nate is like, he doesn't want all this fame, but he's, he's going to, at the very least, get this credit that... He wants to establish this thing where there's like bulldogs in crypto so that you're afraid to like like if, if you have something to shill you're afraid to do it because there's people that are going to come along and within three seconds go that's bullshit get that out of here and I'm you know yes we have a level of professionalism we have to keep but I'm from Philly okay we just won the Super Bowl and then three minutes after we won the Super Bowl a viral video of a guy went viral of him eating dog shit on the street okay so you gotta forgive me I'm a little rough around the edge that guy wasn't me by the way. <laughs> But it was a little rough around the edges. But I think, uh, I th and I think that's important. Like, when I was younger, I'd, give me a listen to rap. Awesome. All three of you. Okay, well, I'm 40, and I love the Wu-Tang Clan. If you haven't heard of them, look them up. They're a great group, youngsters. Um, but I, I got to remember, like, if I was an up-and-coming rapper, there was a lot of, like, scary names and stuff like that. There was, there was a rapper named Ghostface. Does anybody know this guy? Ghostface Killer. If you were an up-and-coming rapper, would you, like, walk up to that guy and be like, hey, would you take my demo team, Mr. Ghostface Killer? Those are scary and intimidating names. But, man, things have evolved. You know what the scariest name in the space right now is? Fluffy Pony. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to bring up my new friend, Mr. Fluffy Pony. Come on up. Give it up for Fluffy Pony. <laughs> I don't even want to know his real name. Thanks, Thanks, Appreciate you. Hello. That's fine. I got him my... All right. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I'm here to talk about uh, Monero's emerging applications. I don't actually know what that means. So we're just going to make this up as we go along. I put my slides like five minutes before I came here, so they might not be up to my normal standard of excellence. But for those of you who don't know, I'm Ricardo Spani. You may know me as Fluffy Pony. You may also know me as that gigantic troll on Twitter, or who the hell is that guy, and why is he ruining Monero for everyone? I'm not the lead, uh, the lead developer of Monero, that's a fallacy, a lie. I'm also not the lead uh, developer, oh, and I said that already. I'm not the creator of Monero either. That's a Russian guy who called thankful for today. We don't know who he really was. We think he's Russian. And uh, he created Monero in 2014. We had a little tiff with him, and off he went into the, into the ether. And uh, probably went on to hack the, the American election, so that's cool. <laughs> At least he accomplished his life work, life's work. You can find me on Twitter and on Reddit, and more recently on Mastodon, which is like decentralized Twitter, because we decentralize all the things. And there is my GPG fingerprint, which is very important if you want to validate the Monero binaries. Or if you're cool, you'll just compile from source. So what I want to talk about is um, there seems to be this desire to blockchain all the things. And I think part of it is because uh, Bitcoin was open source, and so people realized they could just clone the repo and <laughs> create their own scam coin. And that led to this desire to just make everything a token um, or, it, or, or shove stuff onto the blockchain. Um, and I've heard a bunch of ridiculous ideas uh, over the past, like, seven years, six, seven years. My favorite one is, um, I read an article, this is probably like three, four years ago, and it was all about how um, in emergency situations, and this is true, responders struggle to get hold of each other or to get hold of, like, um, the, the joint operations center and whatever, um, because the cell phone networks are clogged up. And uh, sometimes they don't have access to radios, they've only got their cell phone on them, and now the cell phone network's clogged up. And so this article posited that we could use blockchain to fix that. <laughs> so you can't get on the internet, but you're going to use a blockchain to fix the comms problem. So, you know, I mean, this is just one of many stupid ideas using blockchain. And, uh, you know, we're not going to get away from them. Like, people are going to pitch stupid ideas all the time. But what I really want to get out of this talk, I want, what I want 
everyone here to get out of this talk is to think carefully, especially if you're creating applications, or if you're not creating applications, if you're trying to break applications, um, think carefully about what a blockchain is and how it applies. Because a blockchain is basically just a terribly scalable, really slow, really horrendously clunky database. But it's awesome for some things. It's awesome if you need tamper resistance. It's awesome if you need trustlessness. It's awesome if you need um, some sort of like uh, a censorship resistance finality. This is, these are all things that a blockchain can provide. But it shouldn't be like the, the go-to. And I think what I really wanted to, to sort of think about is um, this idea of tokens and, you know, why do we need a token in this application and why do we need a token in that application? And the reality is you probably don't need a token if you're creating an application, although that seems to be the go-to. And I think the reason it's the go-to, I think the reason why people try and model applications with the idea of a utility token is because they want to do an ICO and buy a Lambo. And, and I applaud that. I mean, you know, if that's your goal, no problem, but just be outright about it. Just be like, we're doing an ICO so daddy can buy a new Lambo. Instead of being like, we're doing a utility token. Um, so, you know, that said, there are some, so are some times where tokens are useful. Um, but before I get on to that side, um, and, and there's, some there's some times when tokens are not. So, I wanted to sort of just um, talk a little bit about some of the applications that have been built without requiring a token. So, things like, obviously, Tor. I mean, what's the token that we use to pay Tor routers? There we go. <laughs> But we, we don't. There's, there's, no, there's no token that runs I2P. There's no token that runs Freenet. Um, there's no token that runs Signal or Wire um, or you know, any of the, the comms applications that we've become so accustomed to using. Um, you know, OTR over uh, IRC is incredibly powerful. And IRC itself is, is incredibly powerful as far as decentralized, relatively decentralized federated protocols go. Um, and yet there's no token running that. Uh, and, and even in the blockchain world, the, probably the first um, uh, decentralized exchange is BitSquare, which is now known as BISC. And um, BitSquare like, doesn't have a token. I mean, it does have a token now, but the token is just sort of a way to unlock certain things. And they did that because they ran on a, a donation model for a long time and then decided to do this like, internal mechanic to, to try and fund some stuff. And that's cool. Um, but the core functionality of BitSquare or BISC doesn't require a token at all. So tokens can be largely meaningless, and yet there are situations where I can see that a token is useful. Um, and I think an example of this is, of course, Counterparty, um, which I value as a, an extremely underutilized protocol. Um, and uh, Namecoin as well, I can buy that, um, that there's a native token that, that is required for the functioning of that protocol. But in general, I don't think that, that most applications need a token. So if you're building on Monero, how do you build on Monero? How do you leverage Monero? So there's several ways of leveraging Monero. Um, and and I th you know, I've been thinking about this a lot over the past few years because, kind of, I mean, what's the point of programmable digital money if we're not programming it? You know, if all we're doing is just sending it around. I mean, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, we kind of want to take advantage of the fact that the stuff's digital. Otherwise, we can just carry on using cash. Um, and I think that, that some of the advantages um, of Monero, and maybe the key advantage of Monero, is that there's this massive grassroots movement and people are ideologically motivated. So I think about miners as an example. Um, miners in Monero, and, and this is certainly not across the board, there is a massive cabal of miners who are uh, motivated by profits. They are mining because they want profit. And yet, if you look at um, the stats, if you look at the, 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 pro the potential profit from mining Monero, there are many times where Monero's uh, hash rate stays relatively stable, or even increases, um, and yet at that point in time it's not profitable to mine Monero. So I have to assume that there are either a bunch of, min a bunch of miners who have extremely low electricity costs and have purchased their GPUs for like super cheap, and that's certainly possible. Um, but I think the, and, and of course we've got the, the botnets, and Thank you, botnet operators who are here for supporting the Monero network. Um, I love your work. I mean, I don't, but <laughs> thank you for following the rules of the network. Um, but I think that there, there definitely is a, there's a large group of miners who are purely ideologically motivated. They're mining Monero because they believe in Monero. They're not mining Monero to sell and cover their electricity costs. We're talking about people who have like three, four, five rigs at home. They're covering the, covering the electricity costs out of pocket. 
Um, and uh, they could be selling the, the hash rate on NiceHash. They could be mining, I don't know, Tatatu, whatever coin is super profitable right now. That's also a legit coin I found out the other day that Coinbase is thinking of adding. Um, <laughs> thanks, Coinbase. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, yet they, like, there's this massive ideological core, and I think that that's really powerful. Um, and so when you're thinking of building applications on top of an error, leverage that core. There's all this talk about proof of work being unsustainable and destroying the environment. And my wife's vegan, so you know, like, I understand about like, destroying the environment and oh, the poor trees and all that. I get it. Um, and so if you're building a new application, consider merge mining uh, as a way of leveraging Monero's proof of work. With merge mining, what you're doing is you're building your own chain, but you don't have to go and recruit miners. You don't have to go and find miners and try and motivate them with profit or ideology or whatever. You can just be like, hey, existing Monero miners, would you like some extra tokens for free? Because that, that's totally a thing you can do. Now with merge mining, you do have a native token because you've got to incentivize pools to add support for your merge mine chain, and that's cool. Um, but I think that there is massive benefit to that. Another component of this is, of course, if you do end up going down that road, you build a merge mine application, then you have to try and leverage the existing plumbing. Um, so you'll obviously want to do things like, oh, atomic swaps. So atomic swaps can be uh, achieved in two ways using existing plumbing. Um, there's hash time lock contracts, H uh, hash time locked contracts, HTLCs, and of course Lightning. Uh, now Monero has support for neither of those. So when I say existing plumbing, I mean existing plumbing in the world, not existing plumbing on Monero yet. But we are working towards um, adding HTLC support and adding uh, Lightning support. Um, there are multiple groups that are focused on that, and I think it's something that is achievable within the next sort of 12 to 24 months. Um, and then we'll have the plumbing and the infrastructure for easy and virtually free atomic swaps between Monero and other coins. Now, there is, of course, a, an, an application that is being built called Tari um, that is being built on top of Monero. And this is something that I'm deeply involved in. I'm one of the founders, um, along with my co-founders, Dan and Naveen. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Tari as like a case study, because again, we thought about many things that we can leverage, and we are leveraging um, uh, the stuff I've just described, merge mining. And we're trying to, uh, at Tari Labs, we're trying to um, support uh, HTLCs and Lightning on Monero, uh, as, particularly as a mechanism for atomic swaps. And Lightning, of course, is great from a scaling and uh, privacy enhancement perspective. Um, but you might wonder why we rejected other ways of building a top of Monero Atari. Um, and, and this is certainly, I mean, the Atari uh, uh, design is certainly not set in stone, but we thought about other things. For example, Monero uh, transactions have this little field called TX Extra. And you can basically just shove whatever data you want into TX Extra. Um, and it's not at no cost. You're paying a transaction cost per byte. So it's not free to shove data in the blockchain, but you could ostensibly, like you could build a, a service that uses the Monero blockchain and backs up your entire computer to it if you're so inclined. I wouldn't advise doing that because it would be horribly expensive, but it is certainly something you can do. The problem with TX Extra, and, and this is something we've realized over, year, over the past few years, um, especially the Monero Research Lab guys, um, is that TX Extra only works really well if it's uniform. Otherwise, your transactions start sticking out. And so, you know, you're busy shoving data into TX Extra, and now everyone can pinpoint your transactions, and now they start being able to perform large data analysis, and that's not great. So we're working towards, I think, as a, as a development work group and as a group of researchers, we're constantly working towards ways of creating transaction uniformity. And so anything like that would break transaction uniformity. And so we kind of have rejected TX Extra as a way of building on top of Monero. Um, and, and instead gone the sort of merge mining route. Um, it's something to consider if you are building an application. In terms of, um, of Tari and uh, of what we're building, so Tari is a decentralized assets protocol. <clears throat> so in many ways, we think of it as like the spiritual, I guess, spiritual successor to Counterparty um, or spiritual sister to Counterparty. Um, Counterparty is built on top of Bitcoin and Tari is built on top of Monero. Um, and the whole idea is that there are natively digital assets that could benefit from a blockchain-like structure. So think about things like in-game assets, um, in-game tokens, uh, uh, loyalty points, tickets, 
ICOs, um, <laughs> and other things. Um, and of course, like one of the one of the most exciting things is uh, if you think about like in-game assets and in-game tokens. So if you're like a World of Warcraft player and you spend a bunch of time building up your character and you just played and played and played, and now your character is like really built up and it's worth a ton of money and you're bored of World of Warcraft and you want to go play Fortnite or whatever, it would be great if there was a DEX where you could like sell some of your, your World of Warcraft stuff and buy some Fortnite stuff. Or, you know, just move from one game to another as like a, you know, you're not a pro gamer, but you like play, you know, on weekends and you enjoy it. And you've spent, you've invested time. And you, you've maybe invested money. And being able to like perform that lateral shift from one game to another in a permissionless environment would be great. So these are things that we're thinking about that, that we think Tari will enable. Um, and Tari, the way we're trying to build it is um, in a decentralized manner. So we're, we're, we're taking a leaf out of Monero's playbook um, and the design isn't set in stone. Like I said, we have a bunch of ideas. Uh, we have a community that's forming around Tari. We have a, a company in South Africa called Tari Labs um, that uh, is, has a bunch of developers and researchers that uh, we've hired pretty recently over the past three months. And uh, those developers and researchers will be contributing to the Tari project as well a whole bunch of other people in the ecosystem. Um, there's some Monero people who will be contributing to both Monero and Tari, and there's some Tari Labs employees that are going to be focusing on Monero as well. Um, and I think that this is a, an, interesting, or, uh, an interesting fact pattern in terms of building a decentralized application, because it means that we're not the source of all knowledge. We're not saying, yes, yeah, our white paper, go forth and we're going to go forth and build. We're saying, like, we have this cool idea, we have some ideas about how to build it, and we're, we've got some resources we can leverage, but ultimately we need a community to build it. And in many ways, that community is something that, that rises up out of the, the larger Monero community without poaching resources from the Monero community um, because we're able to feed back and, uh, and share resources as much as possible. Um, but this is an application that leverages Monero's uh, existing technology, or existing, existing security model, rather, um, but we're able to play around from a technology perspective. So, you know, we've looked at things like DAGs, and um, we've looked at, uh, we're very excited about, like, Mimblewimble as a technology, um, and we think that Mimblewimble can be leveraged, because the whole idea of Mimblewimble really is, let's put as little information onto the blockchain as possible. Like, what is the smallest nugget of information that you need for a transaction? How about just a unique identifier? And that's it. Um, and that's a really powerful thing that we're trying to leverage. Um, and then, of course, Lightning and other scalability solutions. Um, and, and I think what's really interesting about this um, is that we can potentially create a fact pattern for other projects that want to build on top of Monero uh, to imitate. They can come into the fold and they can go, oh, cool, that's the way we should be building things. Not let's write a white paper, let's do an ICO, um, and, and then let's centrally issue our security token, which totally isn't a security token. It's a utility token, I promise, SEC. Um, you know, it, it's, it's like, here's yeah, a fact pattern that might actually work. Um, and so I think that's kind of exciting. And I think this, is, this could be the start of a new class of applications emerging that are built on top of Monero. And one of the most exciting things about building on top of Monero and about inheriting that user base in that community is that there's a culture in Monero that is unavoidable. And that is a culture of privacy first, of privacy being a basic human right and a basic tenet of the application that you're building. And I think that that is something that, you know, if you're building on Ethereum, you're thinking, oh, world computer and purple cat t-shirts. Um, and if you're building on top of Monero, you're just like paranoid constantly. And so, yeah. <laughs> so you, you end up with this amazing culture of like, I want to protect myself. I want to protect the other people that are using this tool. I want to protect the user base. And I think if that's the one key takeaway from today, if you're building stuff, it's, you've got to be users first. So to sum up some of the things, um, blockchains are mad hype right now. If you're working for a company, um, you probably have been told, hey, should we investigate blockchain technology? But mom. Um, <laughs> and I think to some degree, you can leverage that. You know, if you're working at a company, if you're working at a, a fintech company or a security company, if you're a, a pen tester and whatever, um, if you're a red teamer, go red teamers then you, know, you can think about ways of, uh, of leveraging that mad hype and being like, hey, we should investigate ways of breaking all the scam coins out there because we can get paid by shorting them when they break. Um, 
If you are building a decentralized app, you probably don't need a blockchain. Think about models like BitSquare, BISC. Um, think about things like Tor and ITP. Think about all the things that have been built thus far that didn't need a blockchain and yet are decentralized. Um, also, tokens can be useful, especially in merge mining scenarios. But it's imperative to first try a less constrained model because tokens also add a bunch of complexity. Incentives are really hard. And, and honestly, stuff like Monero and Bitcoin is it's not just like, oh, slap a token in it and off, it, off you go to the races. I mean, there's this delicate balance of incentives, game theory, um, cryptography, uh, and you know, just pure unadulterated code. And you've got to try and like, balance all these components and all these different people in the, in the ecosystem. And the minute you slap a token on something, you just add this complexity. Um, and the reality is that users don't care about your token. So a case in point, and this is not to knock any other project, but a case in point is BAT, um, I, uh, the basic attention token. I love Brave, the browser. I think Brave is an excellent effort at uh, building a browser that is user-focused user and, and to some degree privacy-focused. Um, and I love the work that they're doing there. Um, and yet they've got this like, token that they did an ICO with, and then they've got this whole little like, in-browser token thing where when you're browsing someone else's content um, and that person wants to get paid for the content, then you can send them some bat. And uh, it's, really, it's, it's a nifty little thing that you can build into it. The problem is that like, people aren't going to go buy bat, right? So they airdrop bat onto people that installed Brave. And then when those people ran out of bat because they were sending it to people when they watched videos and read articles, they weren't really incentivized to go buy more. So, you know, it's like, well, congratulations. You've built a reasonable token economy, and yet users are just not incentivized to buy more. And I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to go tell their boss, listen, when you pay me my salary at the end of the month, please put 0.5% in BAT so that I can use my browser. I mean, it's just not feasible. So it's, it's unfortunate, but token economics are really hard, and users don't care about tokens. They don't want to have a plethora of tokens. No user wants to be browsing and then hit a QR code and then pull out their phone and scan and then, oh, she's plug in the hardware wallet and you know, then they're, they're able to do things. It's not a good user experience right now. Um, and you also don't need to invent a new security model uh, unless you're IOTA and want to win a pony award. I mean, then go ahead, write everything in trinary and get an AI to invent your hash function. Um, if you have a token, take advantage of existing plumbing. So um, stuff like HTLCs, which are being leveraged pretty widely for uh, atomic swaps. And then, of course, Lightning, which is being leveraged um, for everything, for privacy, for um, laps, for Lightning apps, uh, and uh, obviously for scalability. Um, and above all, defend your users first, make money second. I think that this is probably the most important thing that I've learned from working on Monero over the past four years, is um, you will make money if, if you're focused on building a product that is amazing for your users, for the people that, that are using that application. Um, and I think that we're in an incredibly nascent space where everyone has the potential to make a bunch of money and buy their own expensive watch. But we've, we've got to build applications that protect our users first. You know, like making money should be a secondary concern. It'll come. But the, the focus has to be on, um, on protecting users. And that means dog fooding. You know, use the stuff yourself, see where it breaks, like hate yourself for, for making that mistake and this other mistake, and then go and fix it. Um, and I think that's what Monero needs uh, most of all right now is just more people improving the user experience. Because uh, we've got the privacy stuff done OK. We're doing OK there. We've got the security stuff OK. We've got the decentralization stuff OK. But the user experience kind of sucks. And there are a lot of people working on it. But you know, if you haven't played on the Monero code base, now's a good time to learn. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening to, listening to me ramble. And I guess now we'll take questions. Oh, good, no questions. <laughs> There's a question at the back there. Right at the back. Hi, Fluffy Pony. Uh, thanks for doing the talk, man. Thanks. Um, what do you, uh, you talked about atomic swaps. Uh, I've heard some other conversations about what's needed, kind of like what the underlying cryptography 
needs to be invented or researched uh, for that to be able to happen. Could you talk a little more about that? Sure, I think the underlying cryptography um, largely exists. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that, uh, I mean, we don't really have like opcodes in Monero for um, obvious reasons. It's extremely stripped down. Um, and I think that that's probably one of the key things is not, not a sort of generalized opcode, um, but uh, you know, we can do a specific type of opcode that is specifically for HDLCs. So I think there's just some plumbing that needs to be done there. We have multisig, which was, of course, um, a, a big component in pretty much everything. Um, and uh, multisigs utilize or leveraged in a lot of um, HTLC type applications um, and things like uh, zero, no zero knowledge contingent payments. Um, all, a lot of the stuff leverages multisig. So you know, now that we've got that, it's sort of time to take the next step. Um, but the, the, in terms of like the cryptography, I think we're largely there. Cool. Next question. Oh, cool. I answered everyone's questions. What's your favorite? <laughs> yes, I, they're like a child. You can't have a favorite. I love them all equally. <laughs> Paul. Uh, what would you like to see on the UX side, the user experience side? Sure. I, so I think there are a couple of things. I think that um, the, there, you know, the, the first thing is stuff I've been thinking about is how do people earn Monero? How do they acquire Monero? Um, I think that, that if, we, if we create a culture where it's like, oh, you know, congratulations, you're now using Monero, please swipe your credit card, that's not ideal. Um, and I think we can create models where people earn Monero. So I was thinking the other day, like, what's the fiber of Monero? You know, like, like how, are we, how are we building tools that enable people to earn Monero? What's the uh, mechanical Turk of Monero? There isn't anything that, that, that's solving for that, really. So I think, I mean, there's probably some ICO that is, but like, <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't anything really cool that people are building that, that enables that. So I think that's the first step, is getting people on board from an acquisition perspective, um, but doing so in a decentralized manner. You know, like getting them to, to earn Monero without needing to go to some central repository and swipe their credit card, or use PayPal, heaven forbid, um, and the data goes to 600 companies in Europe. Um, and, and then of course, like from a UX perspective, just that, uh, like walking people through, you know, like, they fire up the application. There's all this terminology they've never, never heard of before. You know, what's a view key? Like, what's, what, and my favorite, I, I didn't realize this, but um, I was in Panama for a few days and I was chatting to, to regulators and I kept using the term an address. I was like, and then you just send to that person's Monero address or their Bitcoin address. And after like 30 minutes, someone put their hand up and they was like, so is an address like their postal address? And I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> Oh, that's the level we're paying on. <laughs> and, and I think that we, you know, there's this, this terminology that we just take for granted. You know, you fire it up and then it's like, oh, sinking blockchain. Sorry, what? <laughs> Connected to peers. You know, like none of this stuff makes sense to people. We've got to either change the terminology, which I don't think is going to happen. We, we went through a, a, a phase where we try to change the terminology from address to uh, account. You know, this is your Monero account. We thought that was better terminology. It did not take. Um, and, and even if it is better to terminology, like no one's going to use it. You know, address is the thing that everyone uses. Um, wallet is the thing that everyone uses. So fine, we're going to use these terms, but let's try and define them. You know, maybe we can have overlays. The first time you hit a screen, maybe there can be like a little o overlay that describes some of the elements. Just anything to try and get people through. Um, and I think we'll, we'll get there eventually. But yeah, it's um, I, like the, for a, a, new, a newcomer who's new to crypto, the UX is... Just bad all around. Cool. Uh, I have a sure. Um, so I think uh, your idea about helping people earn Monero is huge. What's the best way people want to build stuff like that to get started? What should they um, do? So that's a good question. I think that that um, anything that helps people earn Monero doesn't. Uh, like firstly, it doesn't have to be Monero specific. It can be sort of a more generalized crypto thing. Uh, one of the things we've done at Globy is. Uh, we'll ingest all of the scam coins. No problem. You can pay in Ripple. Even Ripple. You can, maybe we'll even add Verge. <laughs> but in terms of being settled, you can only be settled in Bitcoin and Monero and Fiat. So that's massive because then it becomes a funnel. It's like, cool, pay us in Ripple. But we'll just convert that to Bitcoin or Monero for the person. Like, 
We're not, no one's keeping Ripple. So, so I think that's really powerful. XRP the standard. Um, I think that's really powerful and I think a, a, an application that lets people earn Monero can do the same thing. You know, it can be like pay people to do jobs in any currency and, uh, and then settle them in Bitcoin or Monero or just Monero, whichever. Um, and I think that there's lots of scope for, you know, uh, you can go do VC, like no problem with that. Um, and, and I think that given the, the conversations that we had with uh, VC firms um, about Tari, and the fact that we were able to raise money from tier one venture capital firms like Trinity and Redpoint and Slow Ventures and all of those guys, I think they've come to some sort of appreciation of um, Monero, the technology, um, and the fact that, that it's not going anywhere despite a whole bunch of people's <laughs> desires. Um, and so there's some, there's tacit respect for Monero. So you just, you know, go build something and go raise VC if that's what you need to do. Um, or just go build something in your garage, do it after hours. I mean, have a side hustle. I had side hustles for ages and they were great. Um, and, and, you know, I think like one of the most powerful things there is building an open source application um, and doing it in a, decent, in a sort of semi-decentralized manner. Just open up a GitHub repo, start an IRC channel, invite some people in, get the conversation going, start a subreddit. Um, and just keep, get people helping out, chipping in and helping out. Pick a technology stack, whatever that is, you know, Go, Node.js, Rust, whatever. Um, build your application. And, uh, and, and people will pitch up and help if it's the right application and it's the right group of people. Cool. Hi, can I just ask, um, sure. you talked about one of the, the main reasons for the success of Monero being um, the kind of shared, the shared ideology of privacy, right? the importance of privacy in our day-to-day life. If you're building a second layer on top of Monero, is there a chance that that ideology can be diluted as there's more and more participants? And if that is a danger, how can we use it to uh, mitigate so I think, to answer your question, um, I don't know, is everyone here familiar with Eternal September? So Eternal September is this thing where, like the internet used to be cool and underground, um, and then AOL came out and dished out a bunch of, uh, of CDs, and suddenly a bunch of people got online um, in September of like, I don't know when it was, September of 93 or 94, whenever it was. Um, and suddenly the internet, and IRC in particular, went from being like this cool underground place to like, a whole bunch of kids coming in and they didn't know the lingo and they didn't know the parlance and you know there were like all these un like like running jokes that they didn't get um, and the culture was like all, all sort of like upset you know the apple card was upset um, and I think one of the the most telling things was if you were on RC in the early days like nobody pretended to be someone they weren't like people would, you, you would go to meetups and people would be the same at meetups as they were in RC. There was no catfishing, there was none of that. People just like stupidly, inherently trusted everyone over RC. Can you imagine doing that today? You know, it was like, oh man, yeah, I'd love to come meet you, but I can't pay for the, pay, pay for the plane ticket. Can you wire me some money? Sure, no problem. I mean, that was a legit thing that happened. Um, and then Eternal September happened and that just ruined it for everyone. Um, and I think that, that to some degree, as the Monero community itself gets bigger and as, you know, sort of Tari grows and we, we start um, hitting more mainstream participants or more mainstream people, then yes, we are going to have our own eternal September. Um, and, and I think to some degree, like, like I realized that last year with the consensus announcement, uh, which I thought was hilarious and a whole bunch of people didn't. Um, and, you know, in, in jokes, like, don't always carry when the audience gets bigger. Um, and I think that we are going to face that um, in waves as, as people come in. You know, there'll be an article published about Monero funding terrorism in North Korea, and then a whole bunch of people will buy Monero or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and then they're, they're going to pitch up because they think Monero is going to get big, and they want to earn money, and they want to buy a watch. Um, and you're not going to be able to control that. You're not going to be able to stop those people from coming in. But I think what we can do, and what we have already, is a culture that carries. We have a culture where people come in and they're like, win Lambo. And everyone goes, shut up, go to you know, uh, Monero price talk or whatever. Um, they get shuffled to different areas where they can go and post memes, where they can go and talk about price and whatever. Um, and it leaves the, the sort of, the, the main thoroughfares, the main um, areas where people chat about Monero are largely free of that sort of thing. And that's really powerful. And I think we, as long as we continue pushing people into different areas, um, then, then that'll be the best way to try and um, stave off eternal September for as long as possible. Cool. Yes? What, what is this consensus agreement you're talking about? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
No, 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 that's fine. At, at Consensus last year, uh, which is a, a, a conference in New York, um, I made an announcement, uh, which was a fake announcement. I announced the Monero Enterprise Alliance, which doesn't exist. Um, and <laughs> I lied. <laughs> you see, yeah, you are using a trustless digital currency, and yet you trusted someone. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> But anyway, yeah, and I took a lot of heat from that. N not, not so much from people who'd been in the Monero community for a long time because they found it hilarious, but there were people that um, on the wake of the, or on the expectation of the announcement bought Monero. And, you know, like, and, and I, like, I mean, I'm sorry that sucks for them, but like it wasn't my intention to, to try and sort of upset the market, and yet that's what happened. So it's, I think my point really was, uh, was largely about just as the community gets bigger, it just becomes harder and harder to try and, uh, to try and manage ex expectations and to have in-jokes continue to run. Uh, second question, you, you said that you uh, met with regulators. What, what, were they, what was that about? What, what are their concerns? Or what, what was their... Um, so regulators, regulators are, are interesting. I mean, some of them have... Uh, well, there's two things. The first is that a lot of regulators... Uh, not, not so much in Panama because they have a, a, a fantastic banking infrastructure, but in Venezuela there were a lot of politicians that love Monero, um, unsurprisingly, so that they can keep all their stuff hidden. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of like, um, well, we like Monero for our own use, but we don't want the people down there using it because we want to be able to extract blood. And, and I, you know, it's, a little, it's very two-faced. Um, and so then they, but they don't express concerns that way. They're like, oh, we really like Monero but we're deeply concerned about its ability to fund terrorism and send money to North Korea. And I'm like, yes, I'm deeply concerned about cash as well. Yeah. <laughs> Gold bars, those are the problems. Expensive wristwatches, we should stop sending those to North Korea. And so, you know, I mean, it's, you just gotta have those conversations. I, I tend to, whenever regulators talk to me and they say, oh, we're concerned about the potential for using Monero for X, I just repeat the thing back at them but use, replace the word Monero with cash. I'm like, yes, I am also concerned about cash being used for that. Cash is indeed bad. And they get, they get the idea. It takes them a, a few tries before they realize what's happening. That's better than me. I would just try to avoid talking. Yeah, is that too. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much.